morning, PHBC family. I'm so thankful that you are here to worship Jesus with us today. I want to read from the word of the Lord and then give a few announcements before we get going. So this is from Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So before we pray and begin worshiping together, just a few announcements for you. First, I just want to thank you for your prayers, for your reaching out to one another, uh, for your giving uh, faithfully to the work of the Lord here at PHBC. I want to encourage you to continue doing those things. If you need directories, if you need contact information, if you need ideas of who you can reach out to, by all means, let me know, and I will do everything I can to help facilitate your encouraging one another. But I do want to Thank you for the work that you're doing there. Um, and then I want to point you in the direction of the many digital ministries that we are putting out. So uh, Pastor Brian has numerous weekly emails or even daily emails to take you through the preaching passage of the coming Sunday. We've got videos coming out left, right. We just had one drop this morning from the Burns family for our kids that is phenomenal. So I encourage you to check that out either on YouTube or on Facebook. And then uh, Pastor Brian and I are still doing the podcast. And so those launch every Monday. And so if you're interested in just hearing, they're only 15 minutes or so, um, but just hearing your pastors talk about things that we think will serve you, I want to commend that to you as well. Um, and then just once again, if there is anything you need financially, food, whatever you can think of, please reach out. We are here to serve you and to love you. Do not hesitate to ask. It would be our joy to talk with you and help you however we can. So with all that um, said, let me pray and then we will worship together. So Father, I thank you for so many things, God, that you have given us life and breath and the opportunity, even in this strange season, to gather together in this way to praise you. And so, Father, as we prepare to lift your name on high through singing and to exalt you through your word, God, please be near to us. May we know that you love us, that you care for us, and that it is good for us to in turn, praise and give you glory. So God, I thank you for the opportunity we have. I thank you for Jesus, and it is his name that we pray. Amen. Higher than the mountains that I face the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change, one thing remains, one thing remains, your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your It never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident. Hey! 
never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.
Good morning, PHBC, and to all of you mothers out there, happy Mother's Day to you. I hope you're having a wonderful day um, with your family all around you, and I hope you're being encouraged today. Thank you so much uh, for what you mean to your family and what you mean to all of us. And so join with me now in praying. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to use technology now during this uh, time of quarantine to still feed on your word and to sing together. And so, Father, I thank you for uh, the blessing that you've given us in technology. Help us, Father, to recognize the importance of our relationships within the church. For the church is just that. It's a, it's a group of people, a gathered group of people where we have relationships with one another. And so help us then to use those relationships, Father, to encourage one another and to press uh, one another toward Christ's likeness. And so help us to be transparent in our relationships. Help us also, Father, even during this time of quarantine, to find creative ways that we can engage others with the gospel, that we could tell them of the good news of Christ. And Lord, we pray that, uh, that, that this quarantine time, that it will allow some who perhaps um, haven't thought about spiritual things for some time, that, that this quarantine would perhaps get them thinking spiritually. And Lord, that you would allow us as your people to be ready to give an answer to those who are asking spiritual questions. Lord, I want to pray for our church, and I thank you, Father, today for our deacons. And Lord, I just want to lift up each one of those um, men who serve as deacons here at PHBC, and I pray, Father, that you would bless them and encourage them, help them to serve the body of Christ well. And Lord, I want to thank you as well for the faithfulness of members in their giving financially to the church. And I pray, Lord, that, that our giving would, uh, would, would be good and delightful that we would be generous in our giving for your word tells us that you love a cheerful giver father we're reminded that there are those among us who are hurting those who are sick lord i lift up to you our precious sister in christ betty murphy now and just and her husband john and i pray father that you would strengthen them and encourage them father i pray that you would allow the uh, cancer that's in her body to, to shrink. And Father, I pray that you give her relief from the pain that she's having in, right now. Lord, I pray also for our sister Ann Ruby and her husband Jimmy. And Father, she's been uh, battling for a, for a long time with her illness, and we pray that you would continue to be with Ann. And for our brother Pete Morgan and his uh, precious wife Gay, Lord, I just thank you for them and ask that you would... Uh, encourage them, that you would show them your grace for Rebecca Todd and her husband Philip. Lord, just thank you for those two precious uh, saints, and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, do a mighty work in their lives and here in these times. Father, we want to pray for our country as, as again, we're in the midst of this coronavirus quarantine still. Some states are beginning to loosen restrictions, even our own state um, allowed for some recreational activities and elective surgeries. And so, Father, we pray that, uh, that we would continue to move in a positive direction. And so, Father, give, give um, our legislators, those who work in the legislative branch of government, I pray that you give them wisdom as they, um, on the national level, they consider different stimulus packages and and just on different levels of government, Father, I pray that you would help them and encourage them to serve their office well with wisdom. Father, I want to pray for the Potomac Heights Volunteer Fire Department just down the road here. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow them to continue to serve their community well as they put themselves um, oftentimes at bodily risk to serve their community. And I pray that you keep them safe for the doctors and nurses and other caregivers, uh, the caregivers in senior homes. Lord, I pray that you would be with them as well as they um, put themselves at risk. Father, we want to pray also for missionaries all over the world. Uh, we have special relationships with some missionaries that we can't even mention here on a uh, broadcast uh, service because they serve in areas of the, of the world where 
uh, missionaries are, are, are not allowed, but they serve faithfully to, to tell of the goodness of Christ to those who are hurting and those who are in need. And finally, Father, we want to pray. We want to pray for the people of India, and today we want to pray particularly for the Saeed people of India. Uh, over 7.7 million Saeed people, and they're 100% Muslim. They, they, they follow the faith of Islam. And so, Father, we don't know of any Christians among the Saeed people of India. And so we pray, Lord, that you would raise up many, many more uh, Christians from that group so that they might uh, be a witness among their own people, that many would come to faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we get ready to continue singing, we're going to welcome up a couple of special guests for us uh, this morning, and they're singing in honor of Mother's Day. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption till where your blood was spilled. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. If you have your Bible this morning, I hope you do, I want to invite you to open up to the book of Romans with me. The book of Romans will be in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20 this morning. Now, I know you'll find this hard to believe, I say with my tongue firmly planted in my cheek, but when I was younger, 
I was a bit socially awkward, and I wasn't the most athletic kid in the neighborhood. And so what that meant for me is that when it was time, for example, to play a neighborhood game of kickball or football, um, I was usually one of those two kids. You know what I'm talking about. There would be 15 or 20 kids gathered together, and we're all going to play a game of kickball. And it was always the, the two coolest kids or the most athletic kids who would uh, declare themselves to be captain. And then they would start picking people for their team. And they would continue to pick until it got down to the last two. And when they got down to the last two, you know, those were two people that the ca neither captain really wanted on the team, but they would pick those two. Well, I was one of those two kids. Not, not the cool kid captains. I was one of the last two picked. And so growing up like that sometimes makes you wonder, makes you, you know, are you ever going to be as good at something as someone else, as one of, as one of these kids? You know, Johnny, he has a, a rocket of an arm, and so he, he's always going to be the starting quarterback or the pitcher. And then, of course, there's Sally, who's faster than most of the boys on the team, so she's going to be the wide receiver. But what does Brian do? Well, truth be told, Brian plays defensive line, and he counts to five Mississippi so that he can finally rush the quarterback. And it makes you begin to wonder, you know, is there any place in this world where I'm as good as these other kids, as the cool kids, the athletic kids? Is there anything that I do as well as they do? And oddly enough, you know, there is something that we all do equally well. Now, before I tell you what that something is, I do know, want to preface it by saying this isn't something that we usually we want to do all that well. You know, we, we don't start off our days wanting to be a standout in this area. Colleges don't offer a major in this field, although many college students do spend a lot of time majoring in the field, if you catch my drift. So, have you guessed what I'm talking about yet? Do you know what it is that we're all really, really good at? Well, yeah, that's, that's right. We're all really good at sin. We're good at choosing our way over God's way. In fact, we're, we're so good at it that many of us at least function, would have the functional equivalent of a Ph.D. in that field. And so let's hear from the Word of God, and let's see what God's Word has to say about sin. If you're in Romans 3, uh, follow along with me. Again, I'll be reading verses 9 through 20 this morning. Paul writes these words. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. It's the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together, and we thank you for your word. And we ask now that you would use your word to mold us and shape us into the men and women that you would have us be that we would be more like Christ as a result of encountering you through your word today. Lord, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're a note-taker, 
here's our central idea for today's message, is that we all stand condemned under the curse of sin. We all stand condemned under the curse of sin. I want to make four points this morning, and point number one is this, everyone is guilty. Everyone is guilty. We see this is in verse, verses 9 through 12. Paul starts off, he writes, what then? And again, just like we saw last week, this is a phrase that causes us to look back into to what, what's been previously written. And so just as a rehearsal, last week we, we learned that the Jews had the advantage of being entrusted with the oracles of God. And this was a significant advantage for the Jews. God loved them and He chose them and He gave His word to them so that they might know Him. The Jews had a special place in God's salvation historical plan. But then in today's text, Paul starts off verse 9 with, what then? Are the Jews any better off? And so we're faced with this conundrum. On the one hand, yes, the Jews have an advantage. But on the other hand, Paul says, are they any better off? And then he answers his own question with, no, not at all. The Jews apparently aren't any better off than the Greeks. But wait a minute. That sounds like a contradiction. I mean, I mean, have we found a contradiction here in the Bible? You know, verses 1, 1 and 2 tells us that the Jews have much advantage in every way. And then in verse 9, the Jews aren't any better off? Is that a contradiction? Well, no, it's not. And here's why. You see, in the opening verses of this chapter, up there in verses 1 and 2, Paul is talking about the promise of Israel's advantage from this salvation historical perspective. The Jews had a special place in God's plan. So in that sense, they have an advantage. But that advantage doesn't exempt them from their own responsibility for their own sin. You see, they're still answerable for their sin. They don't get a pass for their sin. And so do you, do you see how those two eyes, ideas, how they fit nicely together? We don't have a, a, a contradiction here at all. Now, in, in the rest of verse 9, Paul writes, he says, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And I want you to notice with me the comprehensiveness of the language that's being used here. All, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And, our, and remember that in the, in the minds of Paul's original readers, the ones who are reading this letter for the first time, there are really only two groups of people. There are the Jews... And there are the Greeks. The Greeks are sometimes called Gentiles, but there's, there are only those two groups. There are no other groups. And so Paul's telling us here that everyone is under sin. But what does it mean to be under sin? What does that, what does that phrase, under sin, mean? Well, very simply, it means this. It means that every person on the planet is born under the power of sin. No one is born free from sin's power. Now, I may be getting a little ahead of myself here, but in Romans chapter 5, Paul tells us that sin came into the world through one man, Adam. And then death came with sin. And because we're all descendants of Adam, you know, if, if, if those records actually existed, if the ancestry records existed, we could all, every one of us, trace our ancestry all the way back to Adam and Eve. So since we're his descendants, we too have inherited sin and death. We're all under the power of sin, every one of us. And then in verses 10, 11, and 12, Paul begins quoting from Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Associate Pastor Brian read from Psalm 14 at the beginning of the service. And as we look at these verses, look at in verses 10 through 12, as we look at these verses, I want you to again notice the comprehensiveness of this language from these psalms. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned together. They have become worthless. 
No one does good. Not even one. Now, beloved, I don't know how Paul could be any clearer on this point because we would have to do some serious verbal gymnastics with this text to come away with any other conclusion other than the fact that we're all sinners, all of us. Now, intuitively, we we know that's true, don't we? Even, Even the most skeptical among us knows and understands that we choose sin. Now, we'll look at some specific sins in just a moment, but for now, let's just, just focus on that idea, that general truth that we're all sinners. We know that's true. But here's what we do. We relativize our sin. We say things like, well, sure, what I said was wrong, but it's, it's not as bad as what he said. I mean, look at what he said. Or we compare our sins with our own moral code rather than against God's moral code. And so then all of a sudden, at least in our own eyes, Our sin doesn't look that bad anymore. But when we relativize our sin, beloved, we're failing to take into account that that the one we've offended the most with our sin is God. Yes, sometimes our sin is against another person, but even when our sin is against another person, we've chiefly offended God. Think about David in Psalm 51, for example. Yeah, this is, he wrote Psalm 51 after he'd been confronted about his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba. And David says to God in Psalm 51, he says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, you know, in my mind, I kind of picture Uriah from the grave and Bathsheba kind of raising her hands and saying, uh, Excuse me? Against you and you only have I sinned? I mean, after all, Uriah's dead because of David's sin, and Bathsheba is pregnant because of David's sin. And so what in the world does David mean by telling God against you and you only have I sinned? Well, here's what he means. He means that when we sin, no matter how great or how small the sin may be, whenever we sin, every sin is an offense against a holy and righteous God every sin. Whenever we sin, we're chiefly offending God. That's why he writes in verse 10, Paul says, none is righteous. No, not one. That word righteous, it means, biblically speaking, righteousness describes our our moral behavior, our moral standing before God. And so the one who is righteous is in a right relationship with God. It means that if you're righteous, it means that we've met all of God's righteous standards, every one of them. But we know we haven't met all of his righteous standards, have we? We know we haven't done this. None of us, no, not one, we're all guilty before God. And that brings us to point number two. Point number two, we see some types of sin. Some types of sin. This is in verses 13 through 17. Paul describes two basic categories of sin here. He writes about sins of the mouth or tongue, and he writes about sins that are leading to some type of injurious result. So first, let's look at the sins of the mouth, sins of speech. We see these in verses 13 and 14. Paul, he's still quoting from the Old Testament, and He's still quoting primarily from the Psalter here. Verses 13 and 14, he says, Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Now, beloved, I think we can all agree that these verses don't paint a flattering picture of what we do with our tongue the evil that we can do with our mouths. You know, these verses, they, they remind me, our Sunday school class that I teach is going through the book of James. And so these verses remind me of what James had to say in the New Testament letter about the power of the tongue. James writes this in chapter 3. This is verses 5 and 6. He says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue 
is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The evil that can come from our tongue is profuse. He says the throat, their, thro- their throat is an open grave. We use our tongues to deceive. And our lips are compared to the venom of a poisonous snake. And notice this. He says their mouth is full of bitterness. It's not, not the occasional slip up. It's full of bitterness. Now, just think about the things that we've said in this last week. Who among us can't go just in this past week and say, yeah, there's something I said this past, I wish I could take that back. And so, beloved, we need to be mindful. We need to be mindful when it comes to our mouth. You know, we, we've all heard that children's nursery rhymes that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we all also know that that is not true. So we need to be mindful about what comes out of our mouths. And then we look in verses 15 through 17, we look at sins that lead to injury. In verse 15, murder is described. Their feet, Paul says, are swift to shed blood. In verse 16, Paul is describing destruction, ruin, and misery, he describes. And in verse 17, it's anger and bitterness. He says, the way of peace they have not known. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you hear all of these sins, the sins of the tongue, and you hear these other sins, and you think, well, I don't struggle with any of those sins. Maybe you don't, but then again, maybe you just need to take another honest look at yourself. Just to see whether in, indeed any of these kind of hit the, hit the bullseye in your own life. But beloved, even if you don't struggle with any of those sins, I, I want you to know that that doesn't give you a pass. Because Paul isn't trying here to give us a comprehensive list of every sin. Rather, Paul is using these as illustrations, as, as examples of sin. The nature of sin, however... That's what he's going to address next in verse 18. So that brings us to point number three. Point number three is the nature of sin. We see this in just in verse 18, the nature of sin. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And so there we have it, beloved, just that one sentence. That is the nature of sin. The ultimate cause of sin. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, think about that with me for just a moment. Why do we sin? We sin because we choose to do what we want to do rather than what God wants us to do. I mean, even elementary school age children, they know, for example, that it's wrong to tell a lie. But that little girl, sometimes she thinks to herself, you know, if I tell my parents the truth, I'm going to get in big trouble from my parents. And so she decides to tell a lie instead of the truth. Now, did you notice what she did there? She was more afraid of her parents than she was of God. She had more fear for her parents than she did for God. And in fact, you might even argue that she had no fear of God. Or here's another example. Tax day rolls around. We get a little reprieve. It's a little bit later this year, but tax day rolls around. So a man sits down to do his taxes. And if he's anything like me, he's, you, you need some kind of software to help you uh, through all that. And so he's got some computer software to assist him in filing his tax forms. And as he's doing his taxes, he noticed that, well, if I just, if I click on this one little button, this, this little checkbox here, A checkbox, by the way, that doesn't apply to him at all, but he notices that if he checks that box, all of a sudden his refund actually doubles. And he thinks, oh, that sounds pretty good. So what does he do? Well, we can call it whatever we like. We can call it a moment of weakness. We can call it a bad decision, but we will rarely call it what it is. We'll rarely, rarely call it sin. He decides to click that box, even though he knows he's not supposed to do that. And so what's happened here? His love of money was more important to him 
than his love for God. At least at that moment, it's, it's, it's a statement of fact that his love of money was more important to him than his love of God. And so why does he click the box when it doesn't apply to him? Because he doesn't fear God. Whatever else was going through his mind at that moment, the fear of God wasn't present. He showed no fear of God. And he showed no fear for his sin against God. Now, as I said earlier, we need to recognize that our sin is chiefly against God, against a holy and righteous God. Let me read a a brief passage from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. So my Tuesday night home group, we're going through Ecclesiastes right now, and we just read this passage just uh, this past Tuesday night. Uh, Here's what King Solomon has to say in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 7. He says, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. You see, the the people in Ecclesiastes 5 here, the people have gotten into this habit of making vows to God. They they promise God that, you know, I will give you this, this, this something valuable, whatever it is, I will give you if you just help me out of this pinch. But after God came through for them, then... They forgot about their vow, their promise to God. They just forgot about it. Now Solomon tells them that if they make a vow to the Lord, then they need to keep their vow. He says it's better not to make the vow than to make it and break it. Because making a vow and then breaking it, that's sin. So why did they make a vow and then break it? Why did they sin against God in this way? Well, they sinned against God because they didn't fear God. That's why Solomon closes that paragraph. Look there again with me at verse 7. He closes with, but God is the one you must fear. And so why do we sin? Well, we sin because we don't fear God. We, We think, well, because He's a God of love and grace and peace and kindness and gentleness... Surely he wouldn't mind if I told my parents just one little lie. Surely he wouldn't mind if I just clicked this one little box on my tax form. He wouldn't mind that, would he? Now, now please listen to me, beloved. God is all of those things, all of those wonderful qualities. He, He is love and grace and peace and kindness and gentleness. He is all of those things. But he is also full of wrath. Wrath against our sin. He's a God of justice. And He sees everything we do. Now, I, don't hear me wrong. I'm not trying to paint a picture of a God who's kind of like, you know, like Santa Claus, who knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sakes. That's, that's not the picture of God that I, that I want us to have in our mind. But at the same time, it would serve us all well to have a healthy respect and fear for God. The God who created the universe. You know, coming before this God is no small thing. He is majestic and worthy of our praise. And yes, He's worthy of our fear as well. Because we serve an awesome God. Let's look at point number four. This is our final point. Point number four. Sin and the role of the law. In verses 19 and 20, I want, us to sh- I want to show you how the law of God relates to our sin. But first, let's read those verses again. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul tells us here that the law speaks to those who are under the law. Namely, the law is speaking to Jewish people. 
But the law speaks to them in such a way that every mouth may be stopped. In other words, the, the law puts an end to our excuse making. The law uh, makes it so that we can no longer make excuses for our sin. Every mouth is stopped. And furthermore, he says, though the whole world will be held accountable to God. Now, just how is that going to work? How is the whole world going to be held accountable just because the Jews couldn't keep the law? Well, that's the answer right there, isn't it? If the Jews, if the ones who are the covenant people of God, if they couldn't keep the law, then how in the world is anybody else going to keep the law? We can't. The whole world then is accountable to God. For, in verse 24, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. In other words, the law doesn't bring us justification. Now that word justification is a really important word, not only in today's sermon, but also next week's sermon and, and in, in the weeks ahead throughout the book of Romans. What is justification? Well, justification is the legal declaration of a person's innocence before God. Those who have been justified now stand before God innocent in God's eyes. And so when we turn from our sin and we turn with faith to Christ, we believe that Jesus, through His death, burial, and resurrection, paid the penalty that we owe when we do that, God the Father gives us the righteousness of His Son, and the Son then takes on our sin and guilt on Himself. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. Jesus takes our guilt, and we receive His righteousness. So at that moment, we are justified before God. We are legally innocent in God's eyes. And so what's Paul's point here in verse 20? Paul's telling us that the law is incapable of doing that. The law can't justify us. It's just not able, it wasn't designed to do that. But what can the law do? What is the law good at? Well, look at the second half of verse 20. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, I'll say a lot more about that when we get to chapter 7. But until then, beloved, understand this, that one of the primary purposes of the law is to make us aware of our inability to measure up to God's righteous standards. The law brings our sin into crystal clear focus. The law is like a mirror and it reveals our sin like nothing else can. That we are sinners not only by nature, but also by choice. I started out this morning by talking about my childhood longing to be as good at something as all the other kids in the neighborhood were. Now, I was never the best at baseball or basketball or football or soccer. I, I played all of those sports and I enjoyed them. And on some teams, I was good enough to make the starting squad, but I was never like one of those standouts, never the best kid in my school or in the neighborhood. But when it comes to sin, the playing field is level. It actually is. You see, I was just as good at sin as my neighborhood kids were. And conversely, they were just as good at sin as I was. Here's my point. It doesn't really matter whether you're the starting pitcher on a championship Little League team. And it doesn't really matter if you're the most fearsome linebacker in all of Pop Warner football. The ground is level. We're all sinners. And we all need the same Savior. Being the captain of a neighborhood kickball team isn't going to save you. Only Jesus can do that. And beloved, the same thing holds true today. You may be the CEO of a company or you may be just one of thousands of factory workers making a product. But the CEO and the factory worker, they have this in common. They're both equally good at sin. And therefore, they both need a Savior. 
and his name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son into the world to save us when we were incapable of saving ourselves. And so thank you for the gift of justification, not something we've earned, not something we deserve, but a gift given to us. And so, Father, I pray if there's anyone listening today who's never trusted in Christ, that today that they might call out to Christ, turn from their sin, and be saved. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions about that, um, my email address is coming up here in just a moment. Please feel free to send me an email. I'd love to talk with you. Um, in the meantime, especially to you PHP folks, love you. Looking forward to seeing you very, very soon. God bless.